did not demand that this presentation be given in a ballroom, but I think it is very appropriate uh, for what we are dealing with today. Um, so the Gilded Age is the name that Mark Twain gave to the end of the 19th century when American tycoons made massive fortunes off the growing industrialization of North America. It is a time of astronomical wealth and extreme poverty. Um, I'll be using this term, the Gilded Age, a little bit more broadly than Mark Twain, to refer to the period after the American Civil War ended, but before federal income tax is established in 1913, because that's really what I can uh, count as the end of this period. So, um, during this time, American multimillionaires gathered in elite seaside summer communities where they entertained each other in palatial mansions that they coyly called cottages or villas. Um, many of the most prominent members of New York society called Newport, Rhode Island home during the summer months. Uh, this is Rosecliff. It's a cottage, quote unquote, um, but it's also a copy of the Grand Trianon of Versailles. Um, newspapers of the period reported that at this time, there is no place on earth with a greater concentration of wealth than this tiny island off the coast of Rhode Island. Uh, the street which runs south down the center of the island is known as Millionaire's Row at this moment. Bellevue Avenue, it's more officially called. Um, so Gilded Age Newport is also famous for its fashions. Olmsted, the architect behind Central Park, uh, is writing this thing about a local beach, and he detours for a section of his writing to complain about how Newport is so obsessed with fashion. And this is a gentleman coming in from New York City, a town that also has a real reputation as a fashion capital. Um, a local architect, uh, George Champlin Mason, is a little bit more pragmatic. He simply says, then as now, fashion rules Newport. Uh, and newspapers at this time across the country are lovingly reprinting descriptions of the fashions worn by Newport's bells and style leaders. If you're looking at a newspaper from Utah, they'll talk about what the richest girl in Salt Lake City wears when she's in Newport, uh, similar with Philadelphia papers and the Philadelphia inhabitants of the town. So, to survive the Newport summer season, a lady needs costumes for bathing, bicycling, horseback riding, yachting, playing tennis, paying calls, walking, driving, oh, there's walking right there, um, receiving guests, uh, as well as attending dinners, attending the opera, attending the theater more generically, gambling at the casino, um, as well as ball gowns for fancy dress costume parties and the more standard but still incredibly lavish balls uh, that defined the town's reputation for excess. Three outfit changes a day are considered standard for Newport ladies, uh, but eight daily outfit changes are more appropriate if a woman truly wants to be considered a leader of fashion in Newport. In her memoirs, King Lair and the Gilded Age, Elizabeth Drexel Lair reminisced about how women consumed garments, stating that the new kings of trade might work at their offices 12, 14 hours a day, but their wives would have something to show for it. Festoons of priceless jewels draped ample bosoms, yards of historic lace trimmed under petticoats, and the greatest dress designers of Europe vied with one another to create uh, costumes that would grace some splendid ball for one night and then be thrown away. And scholars have perhaps idealistically uh, taken this description of throwaway fashion culture as a fact. Um, they embrace the idea that the ladies of Newport never appeared in the same gown more than once, and newspapers of the period really play into this as well. They're hoping to shock their readers um, with these tales of conspicuous consumption where thousand dollar gowns are disposed of without a second thought. Um, and where these captains of industry might, quote, buy a new yacht each time the old one got wet. <laughs> but if we look at this a little more closely, um, in this time of extreme consumption, who is reusing and remaking clothing and textiles? And the answer is, of course, everyone. Uh, so there are a couple different types of reuse active during the Gilded Age, what I will be calling conspicuous reuse and then concealed reuse. And I'll really be focusing on the latter. Uh, there's certainly a process of buying antiques and publicly installing them in your house, and that's very different than the process of quietly remaking an old dress into a new gown. Um, the, sort of as a point of reference for this, there's a store in Newport at the end of the 19th century that's just selling medieval, baroque, and renaissance tapestries. And no one is keeping these purchases secret. No one is considering them used goods. Um, 
when George Washington Vanderbilt III purchases what he believes to be Julius Caesar's own bathtub and then installs it in his country house, it makes national news. Um, the story is reprinted. It might seem a little weird to publish about your private bathroom, um, but this type of reuse is very well represented um, in newspapers. And so this is Doris Duke's Rough Point, um, now held by the Newport Restoration Foundation. You can see tapestries from 15 Man. So the type of reuse that I'm looking into uh, is a little bit more subtle and far less talked about. Uh, when Elsie Vanderbilt, the, the very wealthy Vanderbilt, ordered a tea gown from Liberty of London, she found the gown unbecoming. And so first, she sells the dress to her friend, Pauline Wagstaff, who offers the gown to a woman named Una, whose last name I have not been able to find. Um, Una considers remaking this tea gown into an evening gown, but eventually passes on the garment and it winds up in the hands of Gwendolyn King Armstrong, who likes it just the way it is. Um, even in the wealthiest street in the world, at the heyday of conspicuous consumption, this type of reusing and remaking can be found in letters and diaries, and is far more common among the wealthier classes than scholars may have previously assumed. Though shopping trips to Europe, and particularly Paris, formed the core of fashionable women's wardrobes, letters and diaries of the Newport Historical Society detail the techniques women use to supplement their wardrobes. Uh, Kate Hunter Dunn began preparing for the Newport summer season in late February, and her diary contains frequent updates on her wardrobe. For the next two months, in addition to her ladies' maid, she employs two additional women to stitch for her. They start by picking apart her gowns from last season, they base them back together with a slightly different silhouette under her supervision, they remove the underlayers as necessary, and they send the gowns to be redyed in this year's fashionable shade of blue at a dye house in New York. Uh, the gowns are then returned to her in April when she employs a seamstress to stitch for four days straight to finish her summer wardrobe. After this, there are no further updates about her wardrobe for the year. Uh, once it's done, it's done, and her careful uh, preparation pays off in the seemingly effortless pool of new gowns that she's pulling from during the summer season. Dressmakers and tailors specializing in remaking advertise in early fashion magazines like Vogue and Bazaar. Uh, some detail their former employers, suggesting that their Parisian origins or tailor training uh, makes them better suited to handle a certain type of fashion. Uh, these stores also advertise that they're willing to remake gowns sent to them through the parcel post uh, without a visit from their clients. For New York City's tailors and dressmakers, this seems to be a potential source of income during the summer months when New York's wealthiest inhabitants abandon the city uh, for cooler, cooler climates. Uh, many of these remaking shops are located in the respectable shopping districts of New York City, uh, where wives and daughters would have been able to shop freely, uh, known as Ladies Mile. It's, I uh, believe, the area between Broadway and Fifth Avenue above 23rd Street. Uh, and this is home to Tiffany & Co. and Lord & Taylor, as well as these artistic remaking shops. Uh, such as Mademoiselle Naftal's, located in the Diamond District, next to the Harvard Club, or Madame Renee's, located off Fifth Avenue, across from Christie's Auction House. Uh, importantly, these shops are not advertising in any of the public newspapers that are available to all Newport residents. Um, if they do advertise, it's in the Newport Social Register which is a sort of early phone and address book, if in the phone book the yellow pages is just replaced um, with a list of the yachts and who owns them and what color they are. Um, this is a private list of the city's wealthiest inhabitants and was only uh, available to the wealthy summer residents and their guests. And you can see these advertisements, they're alongside um, Tiffany & Co., Cartier, Redfern, um, businesses which objectively didn't really have to advertise to this class of person. In addition to remaking, stores would also buy gowns, which could be altered and sold to a new party, um, and often less affluent members of society who would like uh, a Parisian wardrobe would like to be seen in these creations, um, but could not afford the costs would uh, go to these stores. Uh, papers at the Jessup Library in Bar Harbor, Maine, detail these gown brokers as if they are dealing in illegal contraband, uh, saying that a secret, sacredly concealed sort of dress exchange gives occupation to many gentlewomen of modest means behind the veil of profound gentility. These places are never advertised for, public, uh, for publicity would speedily kill patronage. These genteel exchanges uh, specialize in garments that have only been worn once, twice, or not at all. 
Um, and they don't consider pieces secondhand, rather they use the term second cost um, to describe this sort of shopping experience. Uh, these exchanges also provide an opportunity to divest oneself of gowns when going into mourning unexpectedly, um, or if like Elsie Vanderbilt, you've ordered a gown um, from Europe that doesn't really suit when it arrives, uh, you can recoup some of your investments. Uh, there's no haggling with these gown brokers. Um, these sales stress how the point is not simply to get a new gown, but to get a new Parisian gown. Um, but ironically, once acquired, these Parisian gowns are often altered, and they become new pieces in almost every way. Uh, though today, when we see a gown by Worth, we might assume that the bulk of the gown's value lies in its association with that designer. Um, at this time, the bulk of the gown's value is really in the textile for these gown brokers. Uh, they're really interested in the potential for remaking and the potential to uh, transform this piece into a new garment. Uh, those women uh, who didn't order their gowns altered it, uh, or remade still, uh, still participated in the systems of reuse by donating their less favored garments to friends and family members at the end of the summer season. Uh, this is one of the images from the first edition of Edith Wharton's House of Mirth. Um, Lily Bartz relies on friends to supply her with gowns. Um, and this is not when she is destitute, this is at the beginning of the novel when things are going really well for Lily. Uh, the name of this image is Lily reclining in her refurbished splendor. Uh, there are always a few outliers, certainly. There's at least one Newport uh, Society matron who makes a big show out of not recycling or reusing her gowns. Um, as a splashy way of advertising that she doesn't need to do that, um, one matron is supposed to have publicly ordered her gowns to be burned at the end of the season as proof that she plans to purchase all new pieces for next year. Now, I have not been able to verify who did this. It's a story that's printed in the newspapers. Um, alongside a very large image of Tessie Ulrich's owner of Rosecliff, the uh, Grand Trianon copy that we saw on the second slide, um, but Ulrich's family papers do not uh, corroborate the story. Uh, once the potential usability of a garment had been exhausted, uh, ladies' maids would inherit some pieces. Certainly that's considered to be one of the perks of the job. This is what led me into the project. I was wanted to look at this relationship, um, but was surprised by how long the gowns stayed um, before uh, they were passed on to the ladies' maids. Um, and maids would also be deputized to sell pieces at garment exchanges that specialized in clothing, accessories, or rags. Uh, according to the Countess Dash, uh, chambermaids are better dressed than rich bourgeoisies. They wear cashmere shawls from India, jewels, and lace because they levy a tithe on household suppliers the dealers with whom they exchange their mistress's old garments. Uh, this is an image of Oak Hall, one of the clothing exchanges in Boston. Um, some exchange establishments are more respectable than others. Uh, one Newport exchange is located in the front parlor of a local matron's house. Uh, the address suggests that it'd probably be servants going here. It wouldn't be the sort of thing, obviously, that an heiress would do. Um, but here, business could be done under the guise of a social call. And for those willing to travel further afield, the diary of Rose Ann Grosvenor details visits to two clothing exchanges in Providence, Rhode Island, aptly named the Clothing Exchange and the Ladies Exchange. And these are places where gloves, shawls, smaller items could be purchased. Um, this is a map of Newport. Sorry, let me just take that out. Um, now, there are over 100 men licensed to peddle goods in and around Bellevue Avenue during the late 19th century. For those who are not willing to go to the clothing exchange, the clothing exchange might come to them. Uh, peddlers would often deal with housekeepers and servants, um, passing on garments that way. Um, rag peddlers are a common feature of cities at that time, but in Newport, many of these traders deal specifically in ready-to-wear garments. Uh, many of these men are German Jewish immigrants newly arrived in the United States. In 1865, the census reports 22 uh, Jewish people in Providence, Rhode Island, and that's it. Uh, but by 1920, there are over 25,000 individuals. Limited to working in the dry goods industries back in Europe, uh, Phyllis Dillon and others have done wonderful research into the career paths of German Jewish immigrants when they arrive in the United States. First, individuals often began working as itinerant peddlers, saving up money until they could open a storefront, uh, which often doubled as a family home on the upper levels. Um, 
Finally, families would work to open factories where they would produce ready-made garments for sale. This is the process um, Levi Strauss, Henry Bendel, and both Bergdorf and Goodman um, used very successfully. So Noah H. Rosen and the Levine family both make enough money peddling uh, to open stores in Newport, uh, but most choose to relocate to Providence or Boston when they want to expand their business. And Newport has a very rich Jewish history and is home to one of the first synagogues in the United States, that's Truro Synagogue. Um, but those 18th century Jewish settlers of Newport have all moved on by that point. Um, Providence is certainly a major textile manufacturing center at the end of the 19th century, and there's a large Jewish community with kosher stores, schools, and synagogues up there. So even those peddlers working in Newport are most likely Providence-based. Um, Noah H. Rosen, at least, uh, remains on the road for six days at a time before returning to Providence um, for the Sabbath and for holidays each week. So, and um, certainly anti-Semitism is also very much so alive and well at this time as well. It is not an easy life for peddlers. Um, here's a Christian depiction of a Jewish peddler from 1880. Um, and then Joe, as he's known in Newport, or Joe Pina, um, in 1900, very different uh, depictions. Uh, once garments had been bartered for and acquired, they would often be sold to other immigrants. As Rachel said in her presentation, uh, buying secondhand is an easier way of acquiring a full ensemble of clothing. Um, and this is particularly important if you need this for your job, if you're looking for work and you have to appear American in order to be hired. At one point, the Navy in Newport asks that all peddlers cease doing business in the area around the naval base. Um, because they are unable to protect these men from being robbed, presumably by enlisted men. Um, peddlers also have set drop-off and pick-up points on the island uh, where they can store goods, and these points become targets for robbery. And additionally, and I'm not going to go into this today, there's a serial killer active in southern New England in the 1870s who specifically is targeting peddlers as a vulnerable member of society. Um, however, peddlers themselves are a recognized part of the Newport community. Um, today, Newport has the Oyster Festival, the Daffodil Festival, festivals for food and wine and for flowers, more generically. Um, but in the 1880s and 90s, Newport had a peddlers festival. Um, peddlers would parade through town before gathering in set locations where women could play act at bartering with them, exchanging small gifts and trinkets for small sums of money. Um, though Newport's peddlers are forgotten today, they were a really inalienable part of the fabric of the town um, during the Gilded Age. Additionally, other newly arrived uh, Asian families find success through Newport's textile reuse system. Though less information exists about them, uh, seven members of the Lee family set up a laundry business in and around Newport, and they eventually expand their business to include dyeing garments and textiles. Um, and a French family also sets up a cleaning and dyeing business, uh, promising to do this in the French fashion. So I believe that we're ready for a shift in thinking in the way we approach communities like Newport. Um, this is the era for which the term conspicuous consumption is coined, uh, but this type of spending is really performative. Uh, for every Vanderbilt cottage that has platinum gilt walls, there's another Vanderbilt behind closed doors exchanging a tea gown with a friend who may want to transform it into an evening gown. Uh, some might say that we are living in the second Gilded Age right now, but regardless, the way that these families conducted business shaped the world around us in very unavoidable ways. Many of us work at museums and colleges, and these names, Drexel, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Astor, Morgan, are everywhere. Um, the actions of these men have very tangible global contexts, very tangible global uh, results, uh, but I believe it's important to approach them in a more local way and to ground these people um, in the world in which they lived and in the communities uh, that surrounded them. Uh, if no man can be an island, then I believe that no mansion can be either. So, thank you very much. Thank you.